Well, we're going to read then the next section in uh, Luke chapter 9. Uh, verses 10 through 17 that give us not only the, the immediate um, results of, of what happened uh, after the 12 were sent out to preach, but also shows us what, what happened next and how we can, uh, well, basically how Jesus begins to minister to his disciples and blesses them for the work that, that they were doing. And I, I believe that uh, our Lord Jesus also ministers to us as he helps us to do what it is he has called us to do. Well, let's begin by reading the text, beginning in verse 10. When the apostles returned, they gave an account to him of all that they had done. Taking them with him, he withdrew by himself to a city called Bethsaida. But the crowds were aware of this and followed him. And welcoming them, he began speaking to them about the kingdom of God and curing those who had need of healing. Now the day was ending, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away, that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside and find lodging and get something to eat, for here we are in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless perhaps we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, Have them sit down to eat in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and broke them and kept giving them to the disciples to set before the people. And they all ate and were satisfied and the broken pieces which they had left over were picked up, 12 baskets full. Uh, we're all familiar with this particular um, uh, account, but we do need to see this in connection with um, how the Lord was actually ministering to his disciples in this. So uh, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening and use it again to encourage us. Now again, just by way of review this morning, we were looking at Jesus' heart for the lost, his desire to see people come to Christ, come to him. After returning from Jairus' house, having raised his daughter from the dead, he continued to desire that others also be raised, but again, spiritually, through the gospel. That's the ministry of Jesus, wasn't it? He came into the world to do what was necessary to save us, but while he was here, of course, he preached the gospel in order that he might save, in order that he might raise from the dead. And since his disciples were now ready, he called them, to this task. We saw that he gave them power by his Holy Spirit to cast out demons and heal diseases so that those who saw this ministry would know that God was speaking through them and they would pay attention to them. By the way, one thing that I didn't note this morning but we don't want to miss is that the miracles they were doing were all miracles of mercy and compassion to show God's people that he is a God of great mercy. And he is the one who heals. He is the one who meets their needs. He gave them power by his Holy Spirit also to preach the gospel so that the deaf would, would hear when the gospel was preached, so that blind eyes would be opened and they could see, and that those who heard and those who saw would live. Again, we're reminded that unless the gospel is accompanied by the Spirit of God, unless that inward call comes with the outward call, there isn't going to be salvation. There isn't going to be life. Jesus also warned them that there would be those who wouldn't listen to what they had to say, but that they were not to waste time with them. There were too many people who needed to hear the gospel. So they were to move on, but not before they warned them of what would happen if they continued to reject him. And so the, God, the disciples went, they preached, they healed. Uh, with the result, we saw that the report of what they were doing, what had been done, spread all the way to, uh, to Herod. In other words, the people were talking about it everywhere. Jesus blessed their work. Now, remember, Jesus also has called us to the same work through the Great Commission. It's a tremendous privilege given to us to be his ambassadors. He's given us the same Holy Spirit to transform us into his image so that we could reflect his character, so that we would be able to share his truth with other people. He's given to us the same instruction, not to waste time with those who won't listen, not to cast our pearl before swine, 
But, again, to leave them with a warning and to move on to those who will listen. There's a lot of people out there who need to hear the gospel. And we shouldn't focus all our efforts just on a few people. And the Lord has also given to us the same promise that if we will be faithful in our efforts to reach out, He will be faithful to use us to carry out His plans. I mean, He has a plan, and His plan is to include us. And as we do what He calls us to do, He will complete or fulfill that plan through us. Now, this evening, we see what happens after the disciples return from the work. And really, to summarize what we're looking at, Jesus takes care of them. He provides for them. Now, having served Jesus as He called them, Jesus now ministers to them. When we put the kingdom of heaven first, as we uh, were reminded in our uh, meditation, He will do the same for us. He will give to us. He will minister to us. And we see that in three different ways this evening in our passage. He will give us protection. He will give us rest. And He will also provide for us. Now, first of all, if we serve the Lord, if we put Him first, the Lord will protect us. The first thing that Luke tells us is something that's it's kind of obvious and we don't really think about it, and that is that the apostles, when they returned, they survived, okay? They survived their mission. They made it through. Um, now, this must have been quite a learning experience for them. They hadn't done anything like this before, at least not on their own. I mean, there has to be a first time for everything. They had been doing this with Jesus, but now he sent them out by themselves to do it. And this they did, and they made it through. You can imagine what they were thinking when Jesus sent them out. I mean, what is it we tend to think when the unknown is in front of us? Do we usually think the best is going to happen, or do we think the worst is going to happen? Well... We often think the worst, and that's what keeps us from doing what it is the Lord calls us to do, but the worst didn't happen. Rather, the Lord, again, as we saw, blessed the work they did. They told Jesus everything that they had done, reported to Him their work, all the villages they went to, the people that they had healed, the demons they had cast out, the places where they had preached the gospel, the people who had received it, and of course, those also who, who didn't. Now, Luke doesn't tell us this here specifically, but I think we should assume uh, that it, it was probably the same case as it will be later when Jesus will send out the 70 and they return. Uh, they must have been excited. When the 70 came back, they came back with joy because of what the Lord had done through them. They were thrilled that Jesus had used them that their trip had been successful, that they had been able to serve the Lord in this way, that at least in some small way, the kingdom of God had advanced through their efforts even a little. And I think they wanted to share their excitement with Jesus. You know, if, if we don't see Jesus as being fully man who takes joy in these kinds of things, we really don't see Jesus as he really is. I think Jesus rejoiced with them because of what what the Spirit of God had done through them. Now, I think from this, we need to understand that there is a difference between believing that something can happen and actually seeing it happen, actually participating in, in these things. I think the disciples believed, they had faith that Jesus could use them. I think they believed that Jesus would use them, but now they had the opportunity to experience it for themselves. They experienced His power to minister, and they experienced His protection. Now, remember, the Lord has given to us His power. We've already seen that. He's given to us His Holy Spirit, and He has also promised us the same protection. He says, I will be with you. But we also need to understand that we aren't going to experience either of these things unless we actually step out and do what He calls us to do. If we expect to experience power before we go out, where's the faith in that, right? It doesn't require faith when you, I mean, if you know you can lift, let's say, a particular weight, it doesn't require any faith to lift it, right? Because you know you're capable of doing it. Faith is required when you're asked to do something that's beyond what you're able to do. 
And it isn't until we believe that he's able to give us the ability to do this and we actually step out and do it that he gives us that power. The Lord wants us to prove him. He wants us to put him to the test. I mean, there are senses in which we can put him to the test and senses in which we shouldn't to see if what he says isn't really true. And when we put the Lord to the test, we will find that it is exactly as he says, and we will experience the same joy and the same excitement that the disciples experienced. We shouldn't assume the worst. We should assume the best. That's what faith calls us to do. That's what our Lord calls us to do. Now, secondly, if we work for the Lord, uh, he will also give us rest. We read that after the disciples finished telling Jesus all they had, they had done, after they had finished and completed this work, that Jesus took them to Bethsaida. Now, Bethsaida is, is basically a town in Galilee. It's on the northern shore, perhaps a little bit towards the east of the Sea of Galilee. The name itself means the house of fish, which is interesting. <laughs> But another thing that's interesting is that this is the city that Philip was from and Andrew and Peter. This was their town, even though when Jesus finds them and calls them, they were in Capernaum. Uh, this is where they actually started out. This is where they were born. Now, Jesus withdrew from the crowd with his disciples, presumably to give them and himself some rest after all the work they had done. Now, you know, again, Luke doesn't tell us everything that happens uh, in the life of Jesus, and sometimes we have to fill it in from other gospel accounts. But Matthew tells us that after Jesus had sent out the 12 to preach and teach in the, the towns and villages, that he didn't just sit around waiting for them to return, but he also went to teach and preach in their cities in Matthew 11.1. 1. And so they had all been very busy doing a lot of work. I mean, preaching and teaching is a lot of work. Now, now that they've done the work, now is the time to rest. The Lord gives us work to do, but he also gives us rest. Now, that's one of the reasons, of course, the Lord gives to us his Sabbath, the day of rest, so that we might rest from our work and that we might also find rest for our souls because we need rest. If we don't get rest, we die. Jesus wants us to use the time that we have in this world well. He wants us to be as industrious as we can for the kingdom of heaven, but he doesn't want us to run ourselves into the ground serving him. We need to get enough rest so that we can be at our best. It was a lesson that I learned while going through college. Maybe some of you have learned the same lesson. If you burn the midnight oil and only get five hours of sleep every night, the hours that you are awake aren't very productive. If you just take a little bit more time, get a little bit more rest, the hours that you'll be able to do so much more with the awaking hours that it's worth the extra rest. So we need the rest, okay? Now, it's interesting that in church history, if you read about some of the, the Puritans and some of the others, like well, like Charles Spurgeon, and how they worked so diligently and so industriously and how they did so very much, it is possible that some of them may have unknowingly broken the sixth commandment by putting themselves into an early grave because of their desire to serve and honor the Lord. Now, our problem today tends to be on the other end of the spectrum. You know, our problem tends to be finding the motivation to serve. We don't see too many people like the Puritans, too many people like, like Spurgeon, but that isn't always the case. Sometimes we do find ourselves with that kind of mindset, wanting to do everything that we can, always looking for something more and never giving ourselves the rest that we need. Now, if that is the case, we do need to be careful that we don't overdo it. I said a little bit earlier in the, um, uh, the announcements with regard to the women's retreat. I mean, what is the topic for the women's retreat, but how to avoid burnout. You know, don't, sometimes you experience things and you wonder what's going on. Well, it's because you're not getting enough rest and you need a time to refresh. We need to make sure we do that. Jesus knew he needed that for his human body, his human nature. He needed rest. And so the, the disciples, and so he was taking them aside for that rest. Now, the final thing that we see here is, is this, that if we serve him, 
he will provide for us. Now Luke tells us that uh, when Jesus left with his disciples that the crowds noticed that he was missing and they went after him and they knew where he was going. And when Jesus saw them coming, he didn't do what, what we might tend to do, which is avoid them. He didn't look for a place to hide, but he welcomed them and he began ministering to them. Luke tells us that he preached to them and he healed them. Now, sometimes we can have a hard time changing directions, especially when it comes to postponing the plans we have for rest or recreation because, you know, we like that. We, you know, we like that. Our tendency is to want it too much. But Jesus didn't, you see. He was ready at all times to serve those that he saw that were in need because he knew that his circumstances were providentially ordered by his father and his father had brought these people to him and he was to minister to them. Now again, remember that, that the Lord has given to us the Holy Spirit who gives to us the same heart that Jesus has. We have these same desires within us, but sometimes they don't seem quite what they ought to be because we need to cultivate them. We need to be aware. I mean, the Lord gives us, again, remember what Augustine said, Lord, command what you will and give what you command. Well, that's exactly what he does. But the command is to remind us we need, we need content to the desire that the Lord has given to us. We need the Word and we need the Spirit. The Word is to guide us, the Spirit is to motivate us, but we need the clear command to do what the Lord calls us to do. So we see the commands in Scripture, and he's commanding a group of people who have the Spirit and who want to do these things. That's why, again, John says that the commandments are not burdensome to the Christian because they are our delight to do them. But if we don't find them to be a delight, we need to cultivate, again, that fruit of the Spirit. We need to seek the Lord for more of his Holy Spirit. But the command is put the Lord's kingdom first. That's what Jesus was doing here, putting the kingdom first. When he saw the people put their needs before his needs, that's what love dictates, to serve when we have the opportunity. And again, I think a good example of this is when Jesus was ministering to his servants, his disciples, at the Last Supper. They had all come together to eat the Passover. It's likely that none of the disciples were expecting and on that occasion to have to serve, but they were expecting to be served by someone else. And when it came time for the customary foot washing and there was no servant to perform the service, Jesus is the one who got up, girded himself with a towel, stooped down, and washed the disciples' feet. Jesus is our example, putting others before himself, seeking the kingdom first. We need to be ready to wash feet. We need to use the opportunities the Lord gives us in, in his providence to glorify Jesus by doing what Jesus would do in those circumstances, which is serve others. And again, remember, he's given us the heart to do that. We just need to yield to the Spirit as he moves us in that direction. Now we read, as the day was coming to an end, the disciples still hadn't gotten their rest, right? They realized, the disciples did, that the people would be in need of lodging, they would be in need of food, and they were in a desolate place. And there wasn't any way they could see that they could provide these things for the people. And so they came to Jesus, and they asked him to send the crowds away. But, of course, Jesus had other plans. First, he told them, you don't need to send them away. You give the people something to eat. Now, here's a clear example of our Lord calling us to do things clearly beyond our ability. And the reason why he was doing that was so that they would look to him for his abilities. That's what he was doing here. Now, the disciples began looking around. Where are we going to find food to feed all these people? How are we going to fulfill this? And as they looked around, they found five loaves and two fish. Now, we know from John's gospel that this was essentially a lunch that a young boy had brought out with him. So there were more than just the men present. There were also children and women. There was a large number of people. But look, we have five loaves and two fish. And here's 5,000 people. And as they looked at these two things, they were wondering, 
Lord, maybe we should go for takeout. I mean, that's essentially what, what he's saying here. Luke 9, 13, perhaps we should go and buy food for all these people. Uh, we read in John chapter 6 that Jesus said to Philip, and I think it's interesting, remember we saw before Philip is from Bethsaida. He says to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? And, uh, you know, Philip knew the area. He was from Bethsaida. Where can we go and buy some food? Well, where could you go to buy food for that number of people? Jesus was testing him, again, because he knew what he was going to do. And, and Philip said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not enough for them, for everyone to have a little. And I think what he meant by this is even if we had 200 denarii, and remember, a denarii is a day's wage. If we had 200 days' wages, which would be the better part of a year's wages, if we had that much money, um, even if we had that and we could find a place that had that much bread on hand, that wouldn't be enough even for everyone to have a little. That wouldn't be enough. So now Jesus had established the fact that this need could not be met in the usual way. So realizing that there's no human way this is going to be met, just like the woman with the hemorrhage. Remember, she exhausted all the other means. She finally looked to Jesus. Jesus then began to act, told his disciples to have them sit down in groups of 50, perhaps that he might be able to serve them better, or maybe so they could get a head count to see how many people were actually there so the disciples could see and record how many people were actually fed in this event. And after they sat down, Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish and he looked up to heaven for his father's blessing. And he blessed them. And he began to multiply them. And as he was breaking them and he was giving them to the disciples, they gave them to the people. And they all had, not just a little, but they had all eaten and they were all full. And they had had enough. Jesus told his disciples, go out and pick up what's left over from what I've just given to the people, what you've just given to the people. And when they did, they had enough to fill 12 baskets. They had more than they began with, five loaves and two fish. Now they have 12 baskets of leftovers after they fed 5,000 plus people. And that's because the creator of the universe had made more bread and fish from the original bread and fish. You know, the, those that don't believe in supernaturalism, the liberals look at this account and they say, well, the people had all this food. They were just hiding it. And they didn't want to share it. But when they saw this small boy share his lunch with everyone else, well, they, they just, they were ashamed. And so they brought out their food and that's how it all multiplied. But no, that's not what happened. Jesus actually created more bread and fish. And we could maybe think about how he might have done this. He might have suspended the, the law of the conservation of mass and energy. You know, I mean, mass and energy can either be created nor destroyed. He could have created something entirely new out of nothing and multiplied it that way. Or he could have taken some of the stuff that he had already made. You know, there was plenty of grass, plenty of ground, plenty of air. I don't know how much water was around there, but he could have taken that and transformed it like he did the water into wine and made more of the same. But either way, what he did was a miracle, something that only God could do. Now, Luke doesn't tell us, but this had a profound impact on the people. They kept following Jesus around because they wanted more food. They wanted him to provide for them supernaturally. But then Jesus, of course, tells them the truth. You seek me because of the bread, because of the food. You need to seek the food that comes from heaven, that if you eat, you will live forever. You know, another question we could ask is, um, why did Jesus make more than was needed to feed the 5,000? Why were there 12 baskets? Well, we know that was to take care of the 12 men that he was providing for. 12 baskets left over, one for each of the 12. A basket, not sure exactly how big the basket was, but we know it was more than enough to meet their needs. I think another thing that's interesting is that Jesus knew exactly when to stop, didn't he? He knew when they would all be fed, and he knew when he had just enough left over to have 12 baskets full. We might say that was another miracle in and of itself. But the point is this, that now that they had finished serving these others, after they had put the kingdom of heaven first, now their needs were, were being met. Uh, now they were being fed. Now, it's not that they weren't being ministered to while they were ministering. Let's not forget what we saw this morning uh, with Jesus and the woman at the well of Samaria how Jesus was more concerned with meeting her needs. 
and the needs of the people in Samaria. They needed the bread of life. They needed to drink from the, the water of life. They needed eternal life. And Jesus was taking up his concern with that more than his own needs. But by feeding him, remember, by feeding the woman, by feeding them the bread of life, he was feeding on this hidden manna. And I think we do need to understand that while the disciples were serving other people, they too were being ministered to in a spiritual way by the Spirit. And that is far more satisfying than any physical food that we can receive. But we also need to see that after they had done that, now that they were finished um, serving others, that their physical needs would also be met. When we put God's kingdom first, He will take care of our needs. Jesus, in essence, has made it easy to serve him, really, if we just simply trust him, we simply believe. When we serve him, he ministers to us. We, we really, I mean, that's where the ministry really begins is when we begin to serve him. That's when he begins to minister to us. He feeds our souls on this hidden manna. He protects us. He gives us rest. And he provides for our physical needs. The reason why we can do what the Lord calls us to do is because He is faithful to minister to us as we do it. That's what makes it possible. We just need to trust that the Lord will do it. If we don't, we'll never actually get down to putting Him to the test and seeing whether this is true. So may the Lord encourage us to put Him to the test to see for ourselves that the Lord is faithful. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's uh, ask the Lord to help us do that.